My personality type is INFJ. I don't remember my Myers-Briggs result. I do remember taking a different type of personality test that was color-based. My score was a lot of empathy and understanding and then very numbers and analytics driven. I would describe my personality as extroverted and friendly. Open-minded, uh, a go-getter, willing to like work with others and just talk things out, looking for like different solutions to all these problems. I'm more of, of the introvert type, I think. Once you get along with a group, uh, I'll be more of the extrovert type. For me, it takes a while. Uh, and I think that really harps back to my personality of being a lot more independent-minded. Welcome back to You, Me, and On We, the show where you, the listener, and me, your host, Mary-Kate Polanin, discuss the challenges that come with life's uncertainty. And that's the On We. Hello, and welcome to another episode of You, Me, and On We. I'm your host, Mary-Kate Polanin, and today we're talking about the role that your personality type can play in the workplace. And today's guest is Michael Segovia. We're very excited to have Michael on to speak with us. Michael is the principal consultant at the Myers-Briggs Company and designs and facilitates the company's in-person and virtual certification programs, as well as bespoke learning and development training, working with clients in entertainment, technology, financial, healthcare, education, and across countless other industries. His career at the Myers-Briggs Company has spanned more than 32 years, and he has facilitated workshops all across the world. Michael has also presented a TEDx talk on how personality type theory has impacted his life. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Mary-Kate. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, we're really excited to just dive right in because we're big fans of the Myers-Briggs, the MBTI, as some people know it. Um, You know, personally, I've never really taken the MBTI or the Myers-Briggs test, so I don't really know my personality type, but I am very fascinated in understanding who you are and how that contributes to how you show up in all areas, including the workplace. So we're really excited to have you. Thank you. Good to be here. So why don't we start with, um, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested or involved in personality work at Myers-Briggs. You know, when I joined the Myers-Briggs company, now it's been actually 36 years ago, I also didn't know a whole lot about the assessment. My background is in clinical psychology. And so when I was introduced to this assessment, I, there was some learning that I needed to bas- basically undergo. And I would I would describe the whole experience with the term planned happenstance. Uh, there's a professor out at Stanford University. That was his theory. His name was John Crumboltz. And it's just sort of something that I fell into. However, the more I started learning about preferences, the more I started learning about my own preferences and those of others, the more I realized how impactful this information can be in people's lives. The idea for me growing up feeling really, really different, the Myers-Briggs really helped me understand those differences and really appreciate and honor those differences to the basically the person I am now. All, all these years later, they've basically flown by. Yeah, you know, I was recently rewatching your TED talk and I was really struck by how your personal connection with feeling different really informed a lot of the work that you do. And for anyone who's not familiar with your story, I mean your your TED talk is fabulous and we'll we'll oh, link thanks. to it. But if there's any uh example or an anecdote that you'd like to share from it to help people understand like your personality and personality work for the listeners, that would be great. Sure. You know, in that in that TEDx talk, I talked a lot about how growing up, I just felt very different in my own family, very different in culture and work in general, and that there was a lot of pain being in that state. And so, you know, finding a place with an assessment like the Myers-Briggs helped me go from that pain to this place of joy where I really learned to appreciate and honor my, myself. And then it it's helped me over the years understand and appreciate and honor other people. In in that TEDx talk, I talked a little bit about my middle school band director who made this huge impact on my life, who pulled me aside one day and basically said to me in so many words, you're different. However, it's okay because you work hard, you try hard at everything you do. And as long as you keep doing that, you're going to be okay in life. And that was a, a really powerful message that this person instilled in me that I remember now all these years later. That's beautiful. I love that you had someone in your life, like the band director who could identify that for you. It sounds like the Myers-Briggs type indicator is, 
you know, it's a different version of that sort of assessment. Uh, but for anyone who's not familiar with MBTI, can you explain it to them? Sure. You know, the, the Myers-Briggs type indicator was developed a long time ago by a mother-daughter team, Catherine Cook Briggs and Isabel Briggs Myers. It has been, of course, revised and researched quite extensively a lot over the last many, many years, almost the last actually um, almost the last century. And, and the goal of the MBTI assessment is really about helping us gain some understanding around how do we take in information and how do we make decisions in four preference pairs. So extroversion and introversion, that's one preference pair that looks at how do we get our energy, where people who prefer extroversion get their energy from the outer world of action and people and things. And people who prefer introversion get their energy from the inner world of ideas and, and sort of that inner reflection that they get. Then once we look at that energy, we get then get to how do we take in information? And we do that two ways. When we take in information or perceive, we do that using sensing, which is taking in information in a very step-by-step -step sequential way versus taking in information in a more big picture, theoretical way, if you will. Now, it's important as I talk about these preference pairs, I've talked about extroversion and introversion and sensing and intuition so far. We all do both. We just prefer one over the other. Mm -hmm. So once we've taken in information, we then go to making decisions or coming to judgments. And we do that using thinking, which is coming to judgments or making decisions using objective logic, focusing on the task at hand versus taking uh, versus making decisions based on how those decisions will impact other people or how they relate to our values. We call that feeling. So it's thinking versus feeling. And then finally, how do we organize our external world using judging, which is about coming to closure or perceiving, which is about keeping our options open. And again, with the MBTI, it's trying to sort or identify which side we prefer. It's not telling us how much we prefer or how little we prefer. It's just about understanding understanding that we all prefer one over the other. And of course, we all use both of these preference pairs. Well, thank you. That That's a really helpful uh, explanation. Oh, and so we, we kind of touched on your personal connection to personality work, um, but switching gears since the season on Yumi and Anwi is all about the workplace and our professional lives. Um, you know, this is your job, but for someone who doesn't necessarily work in personality types all day, every day, mm -hmm. you know, how can having a better understanding of your personality and the personalities of others help you succeed in the workplace? You know, your question takes me back several years ago where I was then a brand manager at the Myers-Briggs company. We were then called Consulting Psychologist Press. And a new person joined and she was managing different brands. However, she and I had to work together very closely. And I'll tell you, to be completely honest, at first, we just didn't get each other. In fact, I would say we probably didn't even like each other. She liked to have meetings with me pretty much every day where we would go over all of these details for about two hours. And I remember after the third or fourth meeting, I just thought, I, I just, it's too much, too much detail, too much time. I need some of my own reflection time as well. And so after maybe the fifth meeting, 10 minutes into it, I said to her, all right, okay, that's enough. I, I got to go. And I practically ran out of the room. Well, she called me and said, you know, that was actually really rude. And it, and it was. And so I went back into her office and I said, you know, we just, we're really different. And so what we decided to do was take a look at our Myers-Briggs type indicator differences, her preferences were ISFJ, mine are INFP. And so the differences there were really with sensing and intuition. She liked detail. I like big picture information and judging and perceiving. She liked to come to closure with her decisions, perceiving. I like to keep my options open and to continue to explore new ideas. And so what we decided to do was negotiate. Then maybe we didn't need to have two-hour meetings every day, maybe a two-hour meeting at the end of the week. And then that sort of let her flex a little bit. And I flexed by giving her the, then the details that she needed moving forward. As mm -hmm. a result of that flexing, she and I actually became, we started pretty much enemies to becoming best friends, the person that I relied on the most and the person she relied on the most moving forward. So a challenge to anybody listening, anybody watching, maybe tomorrow seek out that person who traditionally really annoys you and instead of walking away from them, walk up to them and see what you can learn from their differences. I, I love that anecdote. And here's where I normally would share like 
a personal example of mine, but this it's an on running joke this season, especially is that I can't really talk about it because my boss is listening, but you oh. know, it, it does sound, uh, it's, it's great to hear you talk about how you found how your own personality and the personalities of others you've learned to, like you said, flex and also understand and compromise. Um, and we've definitely had some, uh, versions of that in our own like staff retreats where we talk about our working styles. So, um, that's great to hear a success story. Um, and so you're talking about this workplace relationship, you know, sometimes they start rocky and then they can become the most fruitful ones that you have. Um, but what would you say are the top three elements of a healthy workplace relationship? You know, with the situation I shared and in situations in general, I think trust is a big part of it because if there wasn't trust, it would be hard for us to even consider flexing to what the other person needs. So trust, I would include there. I would include appreciating our differences and honoring and mm. rewarding those differences. And so you mentioned the word I did as well, flexing. Flexing is about honoring first and foremost who we are and then learning how to flex to the other side when it's appropriate. And when we appreciate our differences, we can learn to do that. And then maybe the third is about incorporating those differences into how we then take in information and how we make decisions. So that let's say I'm in a meeting and that person who I've learned about differences isn't there, and I'm asked to give a point of view or to make a decision to take into account what would that person add to my decision now so that mm -hmm. I'm incorporating that instead of just relying on what I know, learn from what other people can teach me. That sounds like it really helps you show up as like a better team player mm -hmm. um, and not just your own personal agenda being moved forward. I, I love that. How has your understanding of Myers-Briggs changed over the course of your career? I started from a clinical perspective all those years ago. I was 25 years old. I'm 62 now. So clinical assessments that I learned about in graduate school basically told us there was a right and wrong. There was a pass and fail. And so for people mm -hmm. who aren't really certified on the MBTI, that's often how they will try to apply it. And that's actually not how it should be applied. It's why we say everybody should get certified on this assessment. People who are educationally qualified, like I was at a graduate school, would look at an assessment like the Myers-Briggs and assume it was like all of those other assessments out there, when in fact, what the MBTI is trying to do is sort which side you prefer. And that's all it's really trying to do, recognizing, of course, we all use both. So what I'm trying to get across is the MBTI is not a trait-based tool that tells you how much of something you have, which is how I came out of graduate school learning about it as assessments. Instead, it's more of a type tool, which sorts one side over the other. Interesting. So yeah, I, I, I guess looking at it from, I guess we'll say the pedestrian yeah. observer like myself, but I guess, so what you're saying is that, you know, the test, it, like you said, it's an indicator. It's not meant to be some sort of cut and dry. This is the way you will always function in making decisions. It's yeah. just simply, it indicates your preferences, like where you tend to go. Yeah, an indicator so much so that we actually don't even call it a test or exam because test or okay. exam implies pass or fail, good or bad. So we right. would call it an assessment or I know the Myers family would always refer to it as the indicator, which is one mm -hmm. indication of what your preferences might be a good one. Mm -hmm. However, a true feedback session around the Myers-Briggs type indicator, I just delivered a one to one session about a half an hour ago, a 90 minute session with someone. The true process is the person first takes the assessment with the mindset of answering the items how you prefer as if you have nothing and no one to answer to. So what we're trying to do is get you away from the from the roles that you play in work and in life and at home in any way and just mm -hmm. answer how you prefer. So once a person does that, then they would work with me or someone who's certified like me to walk them through understanding what do we mean by the word preferences and then a description of each of the preference pairs where that person would first hypothesize or we say what's your self-estimated type for each of the preference pairs once they do that then i bring out how they answered the assessments on the report the myers-briggs type indicator how they answered the questions on the assessment itself and then you put that together you look at their self-estimated type their reported type that's how they answered the questions to help them get to best fit type so that in the <laughs> end it's not a test that says, here, this is you. It's a process yeah. that the respondent gets to decide what ultimately fits them. 
I think that's such a human tendency to want someone to tell us like, here, exactly. this is who you are and this is what you need to do moving forward, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I have a cold. And so the human tendency is I want to take that pill to cure that cold. Well, the same goes with life. We want that magic pill to tell us everything. Mm. And there's no no such thing, of course. You, you touched on something else that I, you know, as we were going over the topic of MBTI and personality type, something that came up in a staff meeting, and I brought this up, is I'm, I'm always curious about this idea of self-reporting, but also with the understanding that there might be certain like cultural or societal expectations that we have either internalized or have been socialized to have, you know, for so I'll use an example for myself, you know, I'm a woman. And so mm -hmm. there are certain expectations for me to be helpful, et cetera. And so I'm always curious about, you know, does Myers-Briggs, can it help you break out of the expectation or is it helpful? Does it help shine or maybe show a mirror if you get the result and say, actually, that's not really who I feel like inside, but that's how I thought I should answer. Um, mm -hmm. Have you come across that phenomenon in your work? Yeah. And what you're getting at for me is the importance of mindset, because we want you to try to remove those expectations, knowing that it's impossible to do that completely. However, the more you can, the more reliable and the more valid your assessment results will be on, this, on the Myers-Briggs. Now, you brought up the idea for me around thinking and feeling and cultural expectations. I would say pretty much around the world, definitely in the United States, where there's this expectation for men to make decisions using thinking and for women to make decisions using feeling. And when they don't, we get these inappropriate labels that I won't, of course, mention. I won't give them any power by mentioning them. There are different cultural expectations around the world. And so when we continue to do research with this assessment, we have to take that into account. We do know when it comes to percentages of types, they look pretty similar around the world. What will look different is how that preference is expressed based on what that culture expects or encourages and what it discourages. For example, extroversion in the US looks very different from extroversion in Finland based on really? what those cultures experience. And yet there are very similar percentages in both of those cultures for E and I. Interesting. Now I'm curious about what extroversion in the United States tends to look like, but that's that's really interesting to think about. So I guess I'm also curious, can your MBTI ever change over time? It goes back to the idea of mindset. If your mindset, when you take this assessment, is to remove those roles and expectations and answer how you prefer, you likely won't, will not get different results. Now, the theory is we're actually, we describe these as inborn predispositions. Mm -hmm. And if those inborn predispositions are encouraged, then they typically will stay with us throughout our life. However, we know there are times we haven't been encouraged to be the people who we are. And so then we might sit down and answer an assessment like the Myers-Briggs with the mindset of who should I be versus who I am, you could get different results. For example, when I first took the MBTI a lifetime ago, I took it with the mindset of I'm going to new I'm going to be a new employee someday. What should I be? And I answered very differently than who I truly am. If you're able to answer truly who you are when it comes to your preferences, you won't get you won't get different results. My preferences, by the way, in case you're curious, yeah. I'm very open about them, are INFP, introversion, intuition, feeling, and perceiving. And so sometimes people might say, wait, you prefer introversion and for your job, you talk to people as a principal consultant? That's yeah. a big misunderstanding about E and I. Extroversion and introversion is about where we get our energy. It's not about, are we shy? Or are we, can we talk? Do we talk a lot? It's, it's more about where do we get our energy? And every person who I know who prefers introversion, if you get us interested in a topic and you get us to talk about that topic, it's hard to get us to shut up. For me, I love talking about the Myers-Briggs type indicator. I love talking about women's basketball. I, I have heard that before about the perception around introverted and extroverted, but I've I've also like personally can relate to being a very social person. But when I when it comes to recharging, I definitely need my alone time, my downtime. My fiance yeah. is the complete opposite. Oh really? Uh, he he's very outgoing, very social, but like when he wants to relax, he will continue to like stay out and see other people. And I'm like, I don't know how you do it, but if that's what gives you energy, great. I'm gonna stay home and watch Bravo. It'll be great. Is that um, how you manage it? That you decide that he gets to do that? You could do what you want to do? Is that how you yeah. manage it? Or are there other things you've come up with? 
For the most part, um, yeah, I would say like if I need some alone time, I'm very comfortable relaxing at home. And like, I think in the beginning, I used to think like, oh, well, he's out. And like, what does that mean? But I, I've come to understand like we have our own personal time together one on one. Also, yeah. I don't know if it, this is an introvert thing, but one on one time for me, um, mm -hmm. this is veering more into maybe the love languages, but like quality mm -hmm. time is really up there for me. Um, and so if I get my quality time and then he wants his recharge time, like that is a great balance for us. That's what works for us. And that's what any relationship is finding that balance where both people, both people in the relationship get what they need from that relationship. People who prefer extroversion tend to have this breadth of interests and they tend to call not everyone, but they call a number of people their friends versus people who prefer introversion, more of a depth of interests. And we tend to be more intimate in that we might call some people our friends, but only maybe a couple for, of people, not many more than that. And that's fine. Now, where it can backfire is where that person who prefers extroversion really always needs that time and doesn't really flex, or the person who prefers introversion always needs their own introverted time and they don't flex, there's where issues can come up. Well, that's where I give, you know, the Catholic Church a shout out for pre-Cana conversations because yeah. <laughs> we really have been able to have that communication. So um, yeah. going back to, to job search and career, you know, is it possible for someone to use their assessment and understanding their MBTI type to enhance their job search or their career development? You know, we have a lot of data that shows certain types are attracted to certain careers. Now, that's really just a starting point because it just tells us about attraction to careers. It doesn't tell us how well you're going to do that that job or that career. It doesn't give us information about skill. However, it's a good starting point. I would recommend, though, people who are in the sort of a sort of stage of career planning and development to also think about maybe adding something like the strong interest inventory or the super strong assessment, which looks at vocational interests as well, so that you can look at who you are, there's your MBTI type, what, you're, what you want to do, there's your vocational interest side, putting it together, working with a career counselor. There are great career counselors out there who use both the Myers-Briggs and the strong we have a platform, vitanavis.com, if people are interested in looking at that. That's a way to explore your career interests more fully. That recently is including the Myers-Briggs and an online self-estimate component to it as well, vitanavis.com for people who are interested. I can think of a few college seniors who might enjoy uh, yeah. utilizing some of those those resources. I mean, this is kind of a joke question, but if you have any insights, I wonder, you know, what is the standard MBTI for like, say a podcaster? Uh, a podcaster. You talk about being attracted to certain career sure. paths that just made me wonder. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because you'll see all kinds of things on the, on the internet where you'll find Marvel characters in their MBTI type, Star Wars characters mm -hmm. in their MBTI, MBTI type. What I don't like about those are there's not, they're not based on any research. What I do like on those examples are you'll see every type represented. And that's what you're going to find with podcasters. You're going to find in any career, every type will be represented. It's just certain mm -hmm. types will be overrepresented and certain types will be underrepresented. And I would say when it comes to podcasting, it would have to do with the kind of podcast that you're doing where we might see some overrepresentation and underrepresentation. Interesting. So maybe something like a, uh, uh an in-depth conversation like this one would be a very different personality type than say, Could just be. like a chat podcast catching up on, you know, pop culture or things like that. Yeah, very much so. You might find some EI differences there. You might even find some judging perceiving differences there. And I would say differences within the other two preference pairs as well. So in your line of work, you know, have you run into any skeptics or what would you say to someone who might be skeptical of MBTI? You know, the Myers-Briggs is the most widely known, most widely used assessment in the world. And so as a result, it can also sometimes be the most misunderstood, where you'll find people who will say things like, well, people get different results all the time. What those people are citing is really, really old data, and they don't even know that they're citing old data from the 1970s, a form of the MBTI that's really, really old. There are much more recent versions of the assessment that are based on representative samples around the US and around the world that have very good reliability, very good re validity. By the way, reliability, consistency and response. And there's good data there when it comes to test, retest, and internal consistency reliability. Validity is, 
Does the assessment do what we say it does? And we have some really good data there as well. So typically skeptics are people who haven't really read the manual. They don't even know a manual exists. Maybe they're not certified on the MBTI. Maybe they haven't been to our website to see all the research and white papers we have on our website to really show how valuable this assessment can be. By the way, our website, themyersbriggs.com for people who want to take a look at that. Sounds like there's a wealth of resources there as well. So much so. data. We have a research division that is just fantastic. They take care of the MBTI as well as our other assessments that we publish. Again, going back to this idea of like how MBTI can kind of inform our work, you mentioned a bit of a, not a career transition, but maybe a perspective shift that you experienced mm -hmm. by working with MBTI. But have you ever seen examples of a successful career transition based on someone taking stock of their MBTI and saying, okay, like yeah. this is actually where I need to be, or, or I'm, I'm feeling like this is the right next step for me. Sure. I have lots that come to mind. One that stands out is several years ago, I was working with a construction manager at a major theme park. And that theme park was going through some layoffs and the person next to him was going to be laid off. This con construction manager said instead, you know what? Why don't you lay me off instead? And everybody who worked with them said, but we love you. You're great at your job. He said, yeah, however, I really want to explore what else is out there for me. And so part of his package was to work with someone like me, where he took the Myers-Briggs and the Strong and the FIRO B, which looks at your, your the FIRO B looks at your interpersonal needs in the areas of inclusion, okay. control, and affection. So this guy took the MBTI and his preferences were ENFP. And his strong general occupational theme code was, was social and artistic. Not what you would expect from someone who does construction management. And so right. I even started to doubt. I looked at these results and thought, well, <laughs> maybe his mindset wasn't there. However, as we were walking through his results, he said, yeah, that's me. That's me. And we were seeing things on his strong show up around education, elementary education. And so I started to explore that with him. And he said, it's what he's actually always wanted to do. However, he was never encouraged when he was young to do that. He was told, this is what you're supposed to do in our right. society, in our culture. Construction manager is what he chose. And he was really good at it. He actually, mm -hmm. part of his package was some education. So he went back to school, elementary education, and is now an elementary school teacher. I ran into him a, like a couple of years after he finished his schooling. It was at some random event. And he walked up to me and he said, you're that guy. And I said, what guy? And he said, you worked with me. I said, I do remember working with you. And he said, my only regret is that I didn't get to work with you when I was younger. And so that's mm -hmm. really a message for anyone young listening. Find a counselor who will really help you find what you want to do, not what other people think you should do. Because this guy felt like his regret was he spent all those years doing something that he was good at, but he didn't really like. And he could have really... Yeah been happier all those years if he had had something like this happen to him earlier. Wow. What what a great example. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, that's so wonderful that he's happy doing what he's doing now. Yeah, I can imagine guy. him as a, a great teacher. <laughs> Making a wonderful difference of a, a fantastic yeah. example in his community, without a doubt. That touches on uh, my next question around this idea of of workplace fit, you know, and and how your MBTI can contribute to overall job satisfaction and performance. And it sounds like from your previous example, sometimes it's not as binary. Like you can be a good workplace fit and sure. perform well, but not be satisfied overall. Expect societal expectations aside, um, or I guess pr pressure to get the perfect job aside, you know, how can your MBTI type, you know, lead you to where you think um, you will be the right workplace fit and be satisfied in your job that you do well? Sure. I think a lot about a lot of that is understanding first and foremost who you are and then finding a work environment that honors that, that appreciates that. That's why I've been with the Myers Briggs company. You said over 32 years, it's now over 36 years. I'm at a company that really honors and appreciates who I am and doesn't expect me to be to be something that I'm not. Sure, I'm challenged to flex. However, first and foremost, I'm in an organization that honors who I am. I, I work in I do work with every industry and I will tell you, I'll walk in and I'll ask, so what types are encouraged here? And people will share examples and they will be different from their own type. 
And so I'll ask people, so how are you doing? And they'll say, I'm really struggling because that mm-hmm. company I'm working for just doesn't appreciate who I am. I remember working with, and I can't name the company, of course, it was a very large automotive company. And it was very much about sensing, thinking, and judging about you know, order, structure, rulemaking, following those rules. And I remember, I remember the CEO said, we need some diversity on this team. And so they interviewed many people. They looked for somebody who was very different. Of course, they did not use the MBTI as part of that process. That would be inappropriate. However, they found someone really different. And so then I went to work with that person individually, and I asked him, how's it going? And he said to me, not well. I don't think I'm going to last very long here. And I said, why? And he said, because they wanted somebody really different to bring in a whole new flavor to the organization. That's what they said they wanted, but that's not really what they wanted. And I'm not going to last very long. By the way, his MBTI type happened to be ENFP. So very different from that STJ culture. So it's it's really difficult sometimes. We want to work, of course. However, try to find organizations that honor who you are. I've been offered positions at other companies. And, I, and you know, as I looked at those other companies, I realized I don't think I'm going to be honored like I am at the company I work for that really honors me the way I need to be honored and rewarded. So, I mean, I've really enjoyed this this conversation. I'm also, I, I just have to ask because something that you mentioned sparked some curiosity, how it, w- it wouldn't be in a, it wouldn't be appropriate to dig into someone's MBTI type. Can you ex- expand on that a little bit? I'm just curious. Yeah. So not appropriate for selection. So it's why I would not recommend putting your MBTI type on your resume. That's not information I would include on your resume because (laughs) people would see that and not really know what the MBTI is about and then make all these assumptions about what you can and their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same goes with using the MBTI for selection, not appropriate. The items are rather transparent. You know what they're asking you for the most part. And so if you see the job, you would try to, you might try to answer it according to that job instead of who you really are. You're not going to get real results anyway if you're that organization. The MBTI is not about skill. It's about preferences. And I know people who are really good at operating outside of their preferences because they have the motivation to do that. For example, I have a colleague who has preferences for intuition, feeling, and perceiving, and yet does very detailed work, sensing, thinking, and judging work, and does it great. She's amazing and loves what she does. And when I ask her more about how are you able to flex, she says, I don't really see it as flexing. I see it as making sure you have everything you need so that when you get there, you're going to be happy with what I've done and you're going to like me for the work that I've done. She does great work. So what I like to say is any type can do any job, any career, as long as there's that motivation to do that job or career. What an interesting uh, clarification. I love that. Well, this has been such a great conversation and you know, we usually end it with the nod to our our title, Yumi and Ennui, uh, knowing that we're speaking to folks who are maybe feeling like they're in a transitional phase, um, you know, trying to decide the next step, but maybe are feeling a bit stuck. And the idea of is to get unstuck. Um, but we always like to ask our guests, is there anything giving you a sense of ennui right now? You know, that's a good question. And maybe even, uh, I don't know if the word scary is right for somebody with preferences for INFP who We introvert feeling, which basically means we make decisions based on this inner value system that guides us and drives us. So when I think of where I might not be happy in the world or in life, I'm generally a happy person. I guess what I'm sort of dealing with is the divisiveness of our country right now. And that if people understood differences more fully, maybe we wouldn't be in the situation where we are so divisive. It's it's really why Isabel Briggs Myers wrote the first paper pencil uh, items of the assessment way back in the early 1940s. We were a world at war and her thinking was, if people understood differences, maybe we wouldn't be in the situation in the first place. So, you know, we have big elections coming up and I just really hope people will be more kind to each other, more open mm-hmm. to each other's viewpoints and really thinking about how do we protect the rights of everyone and not think about taking away those rights. So deep for somebody who introverts feeling, that's we, where we typically go. It's really mm-hmm. who we are at, at our core. Well, amen to all of what you just said. So thank you for sharing and thank you for being so open and vulnerable in your response. And also this whole conversation has been really enlightening for me and I hope for our listeners at home. So thank you again, Michael, this has been such a pleasure. 
Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been nice being here. And who knows, maybe we'll get to do this again sometime. Thanks again for listening to You, Me, and Ennui. As always, I hope the conversation today offered a bit of insight into whatever you're facing and lets you know that there are at least one or two more people here in podcast land who can relate. Because that's what we're trying to do, build a community. Want a way to go deeper on today's topic? Be sure to listen to our companion bonus meditation with questions to help you reflect on how this topic might apply to your life. If you enjoy this podcast, be sure to like, review, and subscribe. You can also join the conversation at our Discord server, linked in the show notes. I'm your host, Mary-Kate Polanin, and the one thing that's for certain is that I'll be with you next time on You, Me, and On We.